Welcome to Off the Coast, where we examine the views from Vancouver Island with your host, Rosemary Barnes. New and exciting things, preserved and respected things, business, recreation, politics, travel, all from the point of view of the people living and working on the island. Rosemary is a professional speaker and certified speaking coach living in historic Ladysmith and loving every day of the island life. Here is your Vancouver Island host, Rosemary. Good day from Off the Coast Views from Vancouver Island. I'm your host, Rosemary Barnes, the Maverick Voice at Confidence Stages. The show is about Vancouver Island, her people, her places, her challenges, her successes, and what makes Vancouver Island one of the best places that it's one of the places that is most coveted as a as a home in while living in Canada. Today, my guest is Angela Thurston. Angela leads women in creating a potent relationship with their spiritual, intuitive, emotional, and sexual selves. She passionately shares, inspires, and ignites women in the artful ways of self-love. Using her insight, her calm presence, and her vast knowledge, she assists women in feeling safe and comfortable with exploring an often uncomfortable topic. As a writer, speaker, and educator, Angela masterfully arouses new paths of inquiry, breaking up the congestion of long-standing belief systems around womanhood, love, sex, and relationships. Angela has spoken on the stage at TEDx SFU and is the recipient of the 2015 Unlimited Woman of Creativity Award. She currently resides, naturally, on Vancouver Island, more specifically in Victoria. Welcome to the show, Angela. Hello, Rosemary. Thank you so much for having me today. Angela, you are a unique and wonderful individual. I just wanted you to know that. (laughs) Thank you. You have an aura about you that is calming and that is alive and very aware and astute of all things going around you. And you present yourself with such uh, elegance. When you, it is interesting to me that this elegant, this elegant person speaks to the most intimates of topics. How did you come to, were you always this secure, confident, well-contained, well-composed package of a woman? I definitely was not. Tell, was, us, about, tell us about how you, how you came to be the Angela that we know and love today. A lot of it came because I was in a very shut down sexual state within my marriage. And when I was young, I certainly wasn't as confident as I am now. And I expressed my sexuality, but not really from a balanced perspective. It was more of a needy, please love me perspective. Mm. And my, and being, you know, when you're a teenager or you're in your twenties, you have all the hormones. So you're just naturally, spontaneously aroused all the time. So engaging in sexual relationships was really easy. And then after I had children, my sexuality shut down and I wasn't interested anymore. So originally, I was searching for ways to save my marriage. And then I became so intrigued with the process, I began training and studying and it, you know, where I am now is it's not so much about saving my marriage, but about saving myself. How do you how do you get trained in this area? Is there a wealth of information out there? Were you creating it as you went? Were you how did you how what does training look like? There are many programs in different ways you can get trained as a traditional sexual educator, there's tantra training. Specifically for me, I spent many years first actually learning how to land in my body. We have a very large disconnection in our culture 
where we disassociate and we become talking heads because it's, mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable for us to actually feel our emotions within our tissue at a sensation level. So that's really the foundation for me is how does one become somatically present? And then I moved on to exploring um, what became really intriguing for me as I read a book called Wild Feminine by Tammy Lynn Kent. And it was all about becoming familiar with the physical and energetic qualities of our fertility organs. And just that in itself, when I began just bringing conscious awareness to my uterus, my fallopian tubes, my uterus, I began to walk differently. I began to have a different sense of groundedness. So it was like every level of understanding I had and every piece I added brought a deeper, more expansive awareness and connection to myself. And from there, it just evolved. And I just got immersed in different ways of connecting with my body, my femininity, and my sexuality. Okay, Angela, forgive me for being completely naive, and uh, but how does one connect with the sensations of your fallopian tubes? I have to, I have to know this now. <laughs> <laughs> Inquiring minds need to know. Well, it's just taking a moment and closing your eyes and connecting with your breath to start with. That's the most important factor is just knowing what's happening with your breath. So you're not altering it in any way. You're just aware of how it's moving in and out of your body. Okay. And then you're just bringing your intention and your consciousness consciousness into your pelvis. And a lot of women don't even know where their fertility organs are located. So to get some markers, we're going to start with going three inches below your belly button. And then you're going to drop in because your your uterus is behind that place. It's actually quite low in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So connecting and sending your breath into your uterus. And then finding your ovaries. So if you go to your pubic bone, which is in the front, do you know where your pubic bone is? I do. Okay. And then going up to the pelvic crest, which would be the, on the side of your body, the highest point of your pelvic bone. Yes. And going halfway in between the pelvic crest and the pubic bone and put your finger there. And that's approximately where your ovaries are. And there are, about the size of almonds. Okay. And then now tuning into the fallopian tubes, which move between the ovaries and the uterus, and just getting a sense of their existence. And they are the connection. They're how your inner world communicates with your external world. So you can breathe in and just get a sense of their presence in your body. Okay, now how does this, how does this, um, this, this must be the very basic first step. It is. Actually, right. I, the very first basic step would be looking at pictures of anatomy to get a clear vision. Most women aren't even familiar with their, not just their fertility organs, but their female genitalia as all as well. Like a woman's clitoris is actually approximately eight inches long. Oh and, my goodness. Yeah. And most of us just eight think it's long. the little nub, <laughs> eight inches long. It extends <laughs> approximately four inches on each side. So what we see is the tip of the iceberg. Okay. (laughs) Well, this is surprising. This is surprising. Um, So so you you trained by learning the physiology and then by uh, uh, becoming aware of it in yourself and allowing yourself the, the, the comfort 
of understanding the function, both both the physical, mental, emotional function of all of these organs, right? Yes. Okay. Because there's so much power just in that knowledge, right? And the clitoris yep. is the only body part that we have that its sole purpose is for pleasure. Well, wow. that is that is the only function of the clitoris, and we, as women, are so blessed to have that. Self pleasure, in many, for for some people in their upbringing, self pleasure is self indulgence. Do you find you've run across that? Mm-hmm. As and so, well as there's a lot of shame. So let's talk about that for a bit. Okay. What do you... Is it a, a Western thing? Is it a universal thing? Is it... Uh, do, do you find it prevalent in certain places? Uh, and is it a difficult barrier to break through? There's a lot of questions there. I, because I am <laughs> only familiar with our culture, I can only address that. And it is very prevalent in the Western culture. I, 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 I'm not sure about, I think Europeans in general are more comfortable with their sexuality than we are. Okay. Um, okay. Now remind me of the other questions. The question was, <laughs> the question was that, that what is the, what is the shame that's involved in all of this? And what the, the concept of self pleasure. Okay. Well, it, I. It shouldn't be self indulgent, and yet, to we're raised on guilt. <laughs> we are. We really are, and I think a lot of times it comes down to whether we think we're worthy of pleasure or not. Wow. There's a lot that is woven into it. And culturally, there's the religious factor that sex is solely for procreation. And in a lot of belief systems, the, the power of pleasure is taken away from women because our job is really just to procreate. And even though many of us weren't raised in religious households, there is still a cultural ambiance that permeates us. So many of us were grown up, oh, don't do that and don't touch that. That's dirty. That's bad. And in many ways, it w- it's more acceptable for males to touch themselves because their genitals are out there, yes. right? They touch themselves when they go to the washroom. So it's, it becomes more culturally acceptable. But with women, it's not. So it's sort of, it's taboo. And it's not... Um, considered a part of our sexual health. So Betty Dodson is a amazing woman who is 87 and she's actually the mother of masturbation. And her philosophy is, is that masturbation is the foundation for all of our sexual relationships for the rest of our life because it's the first sexual relationship we have and it's actually how we come to know and love our bodies. And if we and it makes a lot of sense if we raised our children to enjoy receiving that pleasure from their bodies in getting to learn about their bodies rather than having that disconnection from their bodies with shame and disgust there would be a planet filled with confident pleasure-filled individuals full of love. You know, the, the, the very thought of a young teenager discovering themselves and then going out and saying, Mom and Dad, guess what I just did, is, is so... <laughs> it doesn't happen, I, or does it? In my world, it doesn't <laughs> Well, so, I think teenagers are really, un- I have two, I have children yes. um, and 
and and they're because of the culture it doesn't matter that i can be open about it there's still going to be reservations so it's not that they're going to come to us and say look what i just did i think it's rather the parents being comfortable with their sexuality and then providing a healthy environment to talk about it even though um, I know when I discuss sexuality and self-pleasuring with our girls, I don't ever expect them to give me feedback unless they want to, because I know it's an uncomfortable topic for them, but I'm still going to offer my perspectives in hopes that I can seep deeper than the cultural imprinting of it, the, you know, because it's taboo. So to encourage that it's really, really important, particularly before you engage in activity with another person in partner sex, is to really get to know yourself. What brings you pleasure? How can you prepare your body so your first sexual encounter is a beautiful, healthy one? Because you know your body so well. It, it's a totally different approach than it, currently. It really, is. It really, yeah. really is. Uh, so, uh, how is it purely a matter of self discovery? It is a matter of self discovery and it, learning it, how to it, receive it, pleasure. I'm sorry, say that again. And learning how to receive pleasure. So, how, how does one go about. Uh, is there, I mean, are there books to follow? Is it purely a matter of, oh, that worked and that didn't? Is it, how does one go about learning the fine art of self-pleasure? Well, I would start there. I would start with exploring your, your body yourself because every woman's body is different and every, every human's body is different and everybody's going to respond in a different way to what they require to bring themselves delight because we're all different sensory beings, right? There, there are books out there. I do mentoring one-on-one with women and I actually have a program where I teach women how to use the power of their pleasure. So when we have orgasms, like, do you know any other natural resource within our human bodies that produces so much energy? No. Exactly. So, and and many women aren't having orgasms and lots of women who are having orgasms, we're having them for pleasure. So I like to take it a step further and take all the mindfulness that our culture is abundant with the the scientific knowledge of how if we set intentions and are mindful about how we feel and how we think and change our mindset. So if we can change our mindset around sexuality, we can actually use the power, the potency of that orgasm towards creation. Because it's not just about creating babies. It's about how do we want to create our lives. So why not intentionally use that power for creation. How in the world do you harness that? Well, (laughs) that's a whole process. Well, yes, yes, it's a big question. A huge, big question. It is a Uh, big question that I I couldn't answer in an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but, but could you perhaps tell us the process behind uh or the the thought behind uh uh the mental state of being able to do that is it it's it's pure it's a mental it's a mental uh exercise right it was bringing all the components together so it's it's creating a foundation so it's going back to the beginning of our conversation rosemary where we're building a foundation with really getting to know ourselves Mm -hmm. because it's so it's sort of putting the pieces together of power because there's, there's power in that. Then it's learning how to circulate that energy because we are energetic beings and there is a specific way to 
run and use that energy in our bodies. And then you're bringing in the mindset and mindfulness piece where you're actually having mindful meditations and building a relationship with all these different aspects of yourself, getting clear on what it is you actually desire to create in your life and and being realistic about it. You know, so many times when we have intentions, we ignore the current reality. So it's learning how to use the energy of the current reality, which sometimes isn't all that positive, but learning how do you use that energy because that's got energy and how do you transform that energy to feed what your end result is and and mm-hmm. and and feeling that in your body and then mindfully placing the intention into the whole equation and putting all the pieces together this sounds uh very much like the missing piece of a great many self-exploration and uh, self-awareness practices uh, that are available today. The, you go into uh, all kinds of, of self-examination, but they never go into this part. They don't. And I know, and I've never actually read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, but many individuals who I have conversations with have read that book and Apparently, he does mention a part, like a very, he, he touches on the power of sexuality and how it feeds all of these other um, mindset concepts. But no, there are very few people who are actually including it in the equation. It's, it's an aspect of us that it is part of who we are. We are the sum of all our parts. And we have to start exploring our sexuality, not just for creative purposes, but for wellness and health. How so? How so? How, how is it? How does it make us well? Well, there's many different chemical responses when we are in states of pleasure. When we're having an orgasm, our Brains release oxytocin, endorphins, opiates, and that makes us feel good, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. It does. <laughs> as well as um, there's there's pelvic health for women because we have all kinds of health issues as we begin to age. We have incontinence, women have uterine prolapse, and if we're not engaging the muscles of the pelvic floor, which um, having a healthy sexuality does do, it helps with a lot of those different states as well. Um, It's certainly, uh, you, you talk about Kegel exercises, uh, when you know to to strengthen the walls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I had a terrible time doing Kegel exercises. Oh, how so? Well, because it was it was very exciting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> and and they would tell me you have to do your Kegel exercises. I don't have energy for that anymore. <laughs> Thank you. I've done it three times today. <laughs> uh, again, what it's you. <laughs> yes, yes, it was just, oh, that was more than I thought I'd share today. But the point is that just simply being aware of how those parts move and uh, uh, brings a great deal of pleasure. And once you have that that pleasure mindset, that's a very different way of looking at the world. Well, it is. And, and we are worthy of pleasure. Like, and our, our minds get... Um, so involved. I remember when I was more shut down and my husband, we'd be lying in bed at night and he'd be, you know, seducing me, trying to get me interested. And I was in my mind, I, I was observing my physical body respond to his advances and my mental mind was coming up with every single excuse and reason why I couldn't do this. Oh, and, my, and my mind would win. So I began exploring that. What is that? And why am I doing that? Why am I shutting down the possibilities of receiving such delicious pleasure? 
So mm. that's, you know, then it really became a choice and a mindset. And we, we spend so much time with uh, connecting with our spirits and our emotional beings. And we're not bringing that energy down into our pelvis where we can really ground it, right? And right. so we continue to op- you know, open your heart, be more receptive. But if you don't have an anchor or a connection to your pelvis and grounded to the earth, there's really no sustainability in keeping your heart open because anytime anything happens, you're going to shut down because you have nothing else feeding you. If that makes Mm -hmm. sense. It comes from a place of, instead of a place of abundance, it comes from a place of, of uh, lack. Yeah. A different, a different mindset, right? Yes. And, And so if we if we if we allow ourselves to uh, enjoy our pleasures, and it, uh, the thought just occurred to me, enjoy our guilty pleasures. You know, it's so ingrained into us that this is this is not acceptable. No, and if you openly discuss that you like sex, you're a slut. Uh, yes, or easy, or. Right. Yes. So it, a, a very so the importance of self pleasure is much. It, it goes much farther. If I'm hearing you correctly, uh, it goes much farther than than the simple act of the of the orgasm itself. But it changes it changes the way you view the world. Exactly. That's huge. Mm-hmm. And your body, like we have so many issues in our culture with body acceptance. And I am a firm believer that if a woman can love her vulva, she has just dipped into a whole new level of self-love. All right. This opens a whole new kettle of fish. So uh, the world of teenage is a whole different scenario with raging hormones and the like of that. So are yeah. we talking about, we're talking about mature women now. Well, I, yeah, I think there's a difference though between self love and raging hormones. Yes. You know, I think that we, but I, I am talking about mature women. That's who I would work with because I, we need to love ourselves if we're going to set that example and educate and provide the the means for our youth to do that as well right so, but the one of the number one plastic surgeries now is labiaplasty and and not just with mature women but with young women oh my goodness yeah it's heartbreaking because oh. they're basing their genitalia on what they see in pornography because there's a general type of vulva that um, is expressed or shown in pornography, and so if and and no two women have the same vulva, right? They're like snowflakes. I can't believe that. Uh, you see, I live in this naive little bubble. Uh, it's my own personal purple bubble, and I can't believe that people would be doing that to themselves. That's mm-hmm. horrific. That's absolutely horrific. Yeah, it's oh, heartbreaking. Yes. Now, I have a question about uh, the the act of masturbation itself, uh, uh, and your partner. Okay. So, uh, uh, because we are raised in this in this atmosphere of shame. And definitely no touching, no touching. How um, we tend to go off and 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 hide by ourselves to do to to pr- provide this for ourselves. Does that create a rift between a husband and wife? I think only if there's not an open communication about it. 
it is can be really sexy to share in self pleasuring practices, and um, I, and I so it, <laughs> it it can be tricky because I know for myself I was never taught that sex was to provide me pleasure. And, and our culture is very much geared towards a man's pleasure. So I know for myself and many women that I work with or have conversations with, they learned how to perform for a man's pleasure. And, and I, I think a lot of that goes back to not having a society that embraces masturbation. Because when we embrace masturbation, it becomes about us. And many women who are in relationships um, hide their practices because they don't want their partner, they don't want to hurt their partner's egos, right? And so I, and it is, it is challenging for some men to understand and some men not, you know, I'm not, there's no black or white or all or none. There's varying degrees. But it, it can be challenging for someone, a man or a woman, to understand why their partner would prefer to masturbate over having partner sex. And I say, why not have it all? Like, why not create this relationship with yourself? And because I never had, I, I masturbated as a child, but I didn't do it shame-free. Right. So in creating that relationship with myself as a, an adult, I am tapping into aspects of myself that I never knew existed. And that spills over into my relationship with my partner. Mm -hmm. Right? Sure. I, 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 as you say, a very tricky situation. But you just have to have open dialogue and 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 it and communicate and explore, right? Because you can learn so much from witnessing your partner as their self pleasuring, as well as have them witness you. I suppose so. So that so that they then know from what you derive said pleasure, right? Mm hmm. Yes. So what you teach then is about the exploration of, of self for not only your own pleasure, but as, uh, but as a means of really, you could, you could then say it changes the dynamic in the household because of the change of mindset, which then expands to the, your your immediate world, which then has the power to expand elsewhere. Exactly. And it does expand elsewhere. It's, to me, I look at it as your sexuality is the center of your solar system. It is the sun of your solar system. We all come from sex. Without sex, none of us would be here, but yet everybody's so afraid of it. And sex is happening around us all the time. I... Look when you go in nature. That's sex. That is creation at its best. And we all feel so nourished when we're in nature. Yes. There is a serenity that comes uh, <laughs> much like after orgasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. and, a, and a calmness and a beauty. And we are, we are just all an extension of that. Interesting point of view. Right. Uh, I find it, I've, uh, as you know, I teach public speaking and I teach people how to uh, speak powerfully, memorably, uh, and charismatically. And it's interesting to me that I have always said that the power of speaking has nothing to do with your larynx. It has to do with the power, and, it, and, and it's certainly not the diaphragm. Um, we're being taught incorrectly about all of that stuff. I have always said that the power of speaking comes right from the girdle. Mm. Uh, and 
in order to speak most powerfully, you must harness the energy of your core. <laughs> there you go. This puts this puts a whole new dif- a whole slant on what I've been talking about for years. Uh, that it is in fact harnessing the whole of your being. Yeah. Very it is. interesting. Yeah, I always look at our pelvic bowl is the the chalice, the golden chalice. Yes. Right. And the Holy Grail lives within our body, but yet we continue to search outside of ourselves for that. Right? Mm. We we can and and there is a, such a connection between sex and spirituality. Like as we can open up and can connect to the spirit within ourselves and have that flow in and through us and as well as when we're connecting with with our partners or partner. Mhm. Mhm. Does the world of fantasy come into this at all? Uh, I believe it does. I, you know, I've learned a lot on my journey when I'm studying a specific thing. Then, right, it was just all about spiritual sex, and <laughs> because the fantasy sex wasn't working any longer, so that was part mm-hmm. of our process. Was when I didn't want to have sex anymore. And whether it was from hormones or exhaustion or adrenal fatigue, you know, these are all factors that you have to look at as well because we are chemical beings. And, and so I, none of those things were working, not like the reading the stories, the watching movies together, the dressing up. And it wasn't until I began these explorations into myself that my whole, um, engagement with sexuality changed. And it was interesting because for a long time, I, I couldn't even fantasize in my dreams. I remember I had a, a dream about Matthew McConaughey and he was <clears throat> um, seducing me in my dream. And I remember telling him, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I'm married. Oh my goodness. So, yes. <laughs> so I began to, you know, question, why can't I even fantasize in my dreams? And then I started reading Erica Jong, and and she, one of the things she states is that she believes that women don't fantasize enough. So then I began exploring that a little bit more in, in the fantasy world, and it really helps. I think that, you know, anything can help, but don't get stuck on one way because then it becomes a pattern and you have a rut. Right. Does that make sense? But but bring it in. And you know, in working with Betty Dodson, she talks about fantasy is just another word for intention or goal. But we get stuck in it having to be a sexual fantasy. But you can fantasize anything. That's where the create, creation process starts. Well, yes, it does. Yeah. It does. Uh, if it, it has to start with an idea, that's <laughs> and another word for an idea is a fantasy. Yes, yes. So I agree. All things begin with fantasy. That's a nice way of putting that. Mm-hmm. You have uh, when you when you work with people, you work one on one, and you work in groups. I understand you have a, a fairly lengthy program. I do. I have a virtual program. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's called The Practical Magic of Self-Love. And it's an 18-week program that anybody from anywhere in the world can do it because we meet on uh, a platform similar to Skype, but it's called Zoom. Mm-hmm. And I, the groups are limited to five women at a time because I, I really love intimacy. But that's so much part of our sexual health is learning how to be intimate and and then everybody has a voice and we get to know each other in that 18 weeks so there's nine live calls so the calls are spaced two weeks apart and then in between there's always home play assignments okay 
And so can you can you share with us a little bit more about what happens in your program? Yeah, it's very much like we were talking about before, Rosemary, where I guide women through the process of connecting with their bodies, with understanding how the energy moves. We do clearing as well because we hold so many of of our wounds and our stories and other people's energy in our pelvic bowls, in our uteruses, in our cervixes. So I teach women a practice to clear that energy and fill them up with clean energies so that they're not left with energetic spaces. Ah. So they're, they're intentionally filling it in. We work with mindset, with um, creating goals and how do you, and how do you put all the pieces together for creation and for self love. And it's so beautiful to watch the layers and depths um, in which women connect with themselves. It's, it's really something I, I leave the calls and I'm, I have to sit and just connect with myself because I, I just can't believe that I get to do this work and, and I'm watching women love themselves in these beautiful, beautiful ways, not just with self-pleasuring that that's a big part of it. it there is that, that huge connection, isn't there? That, uh, and it comes, I think it comes back to it full circle that we, we just don't feel worthy of of pleasure we 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 just don't uh many of us uh, were raised that if you're not working you're not worthy mm-hmm. and pleasure is uh only after the business is done mm-hmm. exactly well when i have a little pleasure to feed yourself so you can get through that business <laughs> well and that's an entirely different point of view and uh, if you're again with the guilt, taking yes. time, taking time to learn to love yourself physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, spiritually. spiritually takes us away from the business at hand. Yes. And I do have to say, I, when I'm busy being busy, I receive less joy in my life and I actually don't get as much done as when I am really strategic in what I'm saying yes to and what I'm saying no to so that I have time to fill that golden chalice. If I have time to fill my cup, and I don't mean with just having spa days, I mean with sexual pleasure, then I have way more to give way more to give and, and learning how to navigate. Okay. I, I, I know now, you know, how long I can go. And sometimes I have to make a conscious effort because I'm not always just aroused. I actually have to make a conscious effort to take the time to get my body in a responsive mood to get to that place of orgasm. And, and sometimes that takes an hour. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half. So it it is setting aside time for yourself, for that self-nurturing. One of the things that I am very clear on are the practices and tools that I teach women are to to empower them. So So they can empower themselves. I actually can't empower anybody. But I can offer and provide tools so that women can empower themselves because we we need support, we need community, we need to be able to go to all sorts of different practitioners for our well-being. But at the end of the day, there is power in knowing that you can do it yourself, that you can sustain yourself, you can fill your cup. And in need, if need be, in those times of real stress, you can reach out. So that's when women would reach out to me, right? They've got to a place in their life where either they are not in touch with their sexuality at all, or they want to be, or they are in touch with their sexuality, but they want to take it to the next level. But other than that, 
they have all these great tools. So they don't have to rely on someone external so that when they're showing up for anything, they're showing up fully, completely within themselves. There's a great deal of power in knowing that you are uh, self-sustaining. Mm-hmm. There is uh, there's a movement uh, toward preparing for uh, here on Vancouver Island. Of course, we are all aware that we should have our earthquake kits to be self sustaining. Should should something uh, a natural disaster occur, and uh, an earthquake and the like of that, and so we go to great lengths to make sure that that we can survive on our own for 72 hours. Imagine what it would be like to have that attitude of I'm prepared, I'm capable, I'm enough yes. to sustain myself for much longer than 72 hours. Yes. And that is so what you just said, I am enough. Yes. And if, And it's about being self-full so that we can show up fully for all the other relationships in our lives. There's, I heard a woman said, give a presentation once on being self-ish, as opposed to being selfish, self, uh, self self-aware and doing things for self is Mm -hmm. so empowering. But it's more than that. It's the confidence that comes from knowing you are self-sustaining. Yeah. Well, and it's learning how to harness that energy, right? We, we have to learn healthy boundaries. And, and the healthy boundaries aren't to keep other people out, but those healthy boundaries are to ensure that there is enough space for ourselves, and, and, and that, and then having that edge, that container that we can also hold all of this beautiful sexual energy in, and, and it gives us such a state of presence. Imagine a world where everyone knew that they were uh, completely uh, self-sustaining, men, women, all of us, and that we, but we were able to reach out to each other uh, for for pleasure, for creation, for whether it's in our business or our sexuality, what kind of world would that look like when everyone was walking around knowing that they're perfectly capable of handling whatever comes their way by themselves? Right, but in with that, like without the attitude that they don't, not that they don't need anybody. No, but no, from the perspective that I am capable. And if all these capable people filled with self-love come together, it's just going to create more love. That, that's, that's what I'm saying. It, it, if we know how to love ourselves, I don't know if you can truly love anyone else. And let's, if, okay, uh, on a personal level, can you really love someone if you do not love yourself? And secondly, let's extrapolate the benefits of that to the workaday world, to the, to the power structures of the world all the way out across the board, can you really respect other people if you don't respect yourself? Can you really accept advice from other people if you can't accept it from yourself? And the core of all this begins with self. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So the power of, of, of what you're tapping into here is immense. It is. And I actually think it goes back thousands of years. I, I, I really think that women's sexual practices are ancient temple practices. And I feel that that was so much what was suppressed by the patriarchy because our power scares them. And so we, we have that residue of being afraid to tap into our power because it brings attention to ourselves and it hasn't went so well for us in the past when women have done that. Yes. Right. I'm thinking of in the days of, of your 
let them please stay your, when in uh, that before a wedding, the, the, the landlord, the lord of the, of the area could take the wife first before the husband did. Wow. As, yes. And how much more uh, powerful, how much more power hungry can you get than to, than to say that uh, I, I have conquered all of these women and how do all these women feel besides stripped of, of any sense of self-worth at all? Yeah. I know it's heartbreaking. And, and that is so much part of what happens to women is we have our power taken away from us. There's a direct connection neurologically between our sexual pleasure and our vulvas. And there's a neural pathways that go all the way up to the pleasure centers of the brain. <clears throat> and if that is infringed upon, it it breaks up that connection. And there, I think there's great healing that happens when women reclaim that for themselves. Interesting, an interesting depth to this topic. And there's, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's more than meets the eye, isn't it? It really, really is. Yeah. I had, I, I really had no idea of what to expect from speaking with you, you know, all things an open mind and let's, let's hear about this. And, and it really makes so much sense, Angela. I know it does. And people get so caught up in the initial uncomfortableness of it. So I, I bring humor to it. You know, that's one thing I have to say when I do engage with women in conversations, there's a lot of laughing. <laughs> Well, to break the tension, right? To break the tension, yeah. Which is which is saying a whole lot right there, that there is tension to break. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's a... We quite sorry. naturally go into... We quite naturally go into the world of shame and guilt and uh, all of that, uh, so that you have to find tension-relieving uh, methods in order to get to the, the heart of the subject, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, uh, like... My grandfather, um, well, and I learned this through my brother, he, he, what is the most sensitive organ when you're masturbating? Your brain? <laughs> Your ears to he- listen to see if somebody's coming. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Boy, that's the truth, huh? It is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, good, good, good. Love that's it. That's funny. As funny as that is, it, it's the truth. So if we could get rid of the, all that energy going towards that sense of, of hearing and put it towards the receiving of the pleasure, just that shift in itself would be monumental, right? But there, there's so many layers to this. It's personal. It's political. Well, and it's uh, social norms too. Yeah. Uh, is very important because the, I mean, I can't imagine a world where it would, where you would want anyone infringing on this private time. That where you, if you, if you, if the intention is to release pent up energy, I can't imagine. How can you not have an ear to the door unless you're in a locked space? You don't want anyone coming in mid-pleasure to interrupt. No. Exactly. You have to have privacy and security and seclusion to do these things. Yes. And so it, 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 it's about respecting other people's space as well, particularly if you have teenagers, because they don't generally have locks on their doors. No. Right. So it's, it's learning how to be in relationship and and honoring everybody's um, time with themselves. The the uh, in Western culture we have such a different relationship with bodies than say in Japan, where women 
it, it's a social activity to bathe together. Mm. And you get a group of women in a in a hot tub, and it is as natural and normal as, and they just speak while they're sitting naked in this wonderful bubbling warm water. You come over to the Western world, and that in and of itself is farther than we are comfortable going. Yeah, it's very true. That's um, I'm actually doing a training with Betty Dodson called Body Sex, and it, it brings in a lot of different practices to assist women with getting over that body shame. But that's actually a whole other radio program. <laughs> <laughs> and those are live workshops. And it, because it's true, we are uncomfortable. And actually, after spending time with women in a group where you have no clothes on, it taps into something within you, you know, going back to all these practices being really ancient, that it's so natural just to be naked together, not, no matter what your size and shape. And yet to the Western world, that is... To, aside from aside from a very few, uh, do you know many women that would be comfortable with that? No, but I am hoping to change that. And one woman we, at a time. One woman at a time. We don't have to, and I think that's the thing: is we're so inundated with the cultural imprinting of what a woman should and should not look like that we have so many personal hangups and, and we don't have to be perfect to be naked. We don't have to be perfect to love ourselves. We don't have to be perfect to receive pleasure. We are perfect exactly the way we are. What a concept. Um, I think you need to speak to media and all the advertising agencies and the photo brushing of magazines uh, because we're having a, uh, it's a crisis. It is. And, but there's way more awareness around it than there ever has been. Yes. So there's way more conversations and dialogue and change occurring. It's slow, but it, it definitely is happening. I, I, I do feel the shift. That is good news because I think women have lived in shame long enough. Yeah. And, and repression and denial. As the, you know, it's interesting as part of the research that I am doing for uh, the study of the generation gap in the business workplace, I'm going through history to come up with correlating factors. And the rise of birth control and the change of attitude toward abortion, and the, the, the more power women are claiming back for themselves is leading to more openness about these kinds of conversations. Women have always had power, but always from... Did you ever see the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Yes. Okay, so the man is the head, but the woman is the neck that can turn the head any way she wants to. Well, now the women are becoming the head. Yes. And taking their place as being responsible for their own, for their own selves. So that these kinds of conversations are possible now mm -hmm. is, is uh, because women are beginning to claim their own power and the power for their own pleasure. That's right. And learning how to harness the power of pleasure. Yes. How can our listeners get a hold of you should they wish to work with you or, or continue to explore this conversation? I, they can get to my website at AngelaThurston.com. They can find me on Facebook at Angela Thurston, both on my personal and uh, business page, and on Twitter, Angela underscore Thurston. T-H-U-R-S-T-O-N. Angela, it has been a very intriguing conversation. I thank you for your courage in bringing this to, to make this acceptable and 
inspirational and desirable for women to pursue the the art of 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 creating pleasure for themselves by themselves to benefit everyone. Uh, I I thank you so much for being on our show today. Very enlightening. Well, thank you so much, Rosemary, for having me and being so open to creating such a wonderful conversation. Angela, you're marvelous. Thank you. On our next show, July the 20th, uh, my guest is going to be the inimitable Kate Bergen, who is in the media and works with Shaw, and she's doing incredibly strong things with powerhouse women uh, here on Vancouver Island and now going across Canada. I'm looking forward to speaking with everyone again next week. This is Rosemary Barnes, Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island, hoping you have a wonderful week of the island life. Thank you for listening to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island with host Rosemary Barnes. To book Rosemary as a speaker or speaking coach or to offer suggestions of extraordinary guests for the show, please visit her website at www.confidencestages.com.